Not a day goes by where there's not massive news out of the United States and the best in the business is the wonderful Megan Kelly. Her show has been amazing the past couple of weeks and it's so good to be able to see her face to face via the internet. Yet again, our favourite time of the week is to talk to her. Hello, mate. Wow, a lot's happening. <laughs> Just like all day, every day. So let's talk about JD Vance. Uh, you did an excellent interview with him where basically you kind of offered the off ramps if he wanted to take it with the crazy cat lady stuff and said he doubled down. Also, correctly, you showed some of the context. He's not just talking about random childless people. He's talking about the types of people who end up uh, you know, running institutions, politics, media. Um, but of course, all of that context doesn't matter. It's just anyone without a child is a crazy cat lady. Uh, outrage ensues. CNN has another bucket of new stuff that's happened in the past couple of days. Um, let's cut to the chase. You spoke to him. You looked into his eyes the same way that I do you now. Is he going to make it? Yeah, he's going to make it. Trump doesn't backtrack on big decisions like who his vice presidential running mate is going to be. And let me tell you, I've been through this long enough to know no matter who Trump selected, they'd be going through this. They would have found plenty of dirt on Doug Burgum, on uh, Glenn Youngkin, on Nikki Haley, on Ron DeSantis. Any of them would have been demonized in whatever particular way that they had a weakness on. And this is, I mean, as weaknesses go, this, is, this one's kind of pathetic. He said some provocative things on cable. He stirred the you-know-what to get attention on an issue and was kind of, you know, pardon the term, catty about making his point. That's He's not the first to do that on cable news. I mean, look at the way Trump talks. And he got elected president. This is not a deal breaker for J.D. Vance. The Democrats don't have a lot on J.D., and they do consider him a massive threat given his genuine ties to Appalachia and the white working class. And they're trying to do their best to stir up hatred for him. Hatred. I mean, that's they just sent out a tweet saying he hates women. And why are they doing that? Because they've got to drive up their numbers with the women vote. And they're really, really hoping that Americans will forget that it is their party that's in favor of making women get punched in the face by male boxers masquerading as females, by making our little girls go into locker rooms and see penises everywhere, by letting 14-year-old girls have their breasts chopped off when they express a little gender confusion, but really what's underlying it is depression. That's their party. And so they really want us to get upset over childless cat lady comments that JD said on a cable news show, leading us to believe he hates women and not them, not the ones who are actually chopping off the breasts of young girls who might be going through a bout of temporary blues that come with the onset of puberty. It's insane. And they have a compliant media who will push these lies as they push lies that, oh, J.D. Vance, he's reversed his position on many, many issues from just eight years ago. And they'll trot out some trans friend of J.D.'s from law school saying he's reversed himself on everything just for money and power without calling to attention the fact that Kamala Harris has reversed herself in the past 24 hours on at least four massive policy positions that would actually affect millions of Americans. It's incredibly frustrating but it's our media and it's a challenge that Republicans face every election cycle. Now, I think that sort of in increasingly, as we always know, the media sort of lent to the left, but they lost their brains post-16, right? So they thought, you know, we, but by, by, by treating both candidates as equal, we failed. So therefore, we must have this position where uh, you know, one is elevated to saintly status while the other is never allowed to get out of first gear. Now, that was always the plan on Donald Trump. Then a whole bunch of stuff obviously changed, including their lies about Biden becoming exposed. But your sense as somebody who's, who's seen the game from lots of different angles and had success at all of those different things, is the power of the machine as effective as it was in 20 or even attempted to be in 16? Because it feels to me like even in the New York Times poll, the number one source of people's news in that poll in the US is social media media. Now, by extension, I would suggest that that means YouTube shows and lots of other things that are not the traditional newspaper TV show. Do you think that we're dealing with a different market that is trying to play the same game? Look, they don't have anywhere near the power that they used to. But if you're talking about activating the Democratic base, they are still very powerful, very powerful. 
I mean, it was essentially the news media that got Joe Biden out of office, or at least out of his second term candidacy and potentially out of office. We're not sure who's running the country right now. I'll get back to you. Um, so they do have a lot of power when it comes to Democrats and they're exercising it. They're they're energizing their base. They're trying to reach out to those you know, independents are kind of split, maybe 55, 45 Republican Democrat as a rule, you know, leaning. And uh, they're trying to get those 45 incentivized to go out and vote for Kamala and try to rewrite her all of her history. So you can't write them off as feckless yet. But yeah, I mean, compared to what they used to be in terms of influence, influencing the entire country, they're a shadow of their former selves. It's actually really kind of fun to watch them express frustration at the loss of, you know, holding the national narrative over these massive conversations. They can't stand the fact that J.D. Vance came to me, for example, to have his come to Jesus interview after those cat lady comments blew up. They, they hate having to cite someone like me in the New York Times, which they did, um, because it's an admission that they don't have a monopoly on power anymore. And I noticed like the Wall Street Journal, they did a podcast about J.D.'s comments did they cite his interview with me in which we just got, no, they waited until he sat down with a Fox property, Trey Gowdy on Fox News, and cited that because they really don't want to come to grips with the fact that their old model of business is dying. It's hanging on by a thread. But as I say, within Democrat circles, it's still alive and well. Well, and, and, and this is so important for people to understand uh, who, who are a bit casual about this, right? That you've got yourself, You've got Tucker, you've got Joe Rogan, and there's a whole collection of others, right, that are doing massive numbers, mega numbers, like basically kind of big football game numbers each and every day compared to what's rolling out on television and radio. But the arrogance of the normal machine is that unless it's connected to something that's been around for 30 years, then it doesn't matter. And I think this is a real blind spot because obviously... You know, I'm paying attention to, to what you and Tucker and lots of other people are saying. I try to find whatever the equivalent is on the left. The best I can come up with is the Young Turks, but they're kind of weird. But the point is... is, is Save is America, that, that's another one. The, is that, OK, but they're, they're doing OK, but they're not doing your numbers. Um, so it feels to me Pretty that there's strong. this... Pretty Depends on the day. Yeah, but, but do you get a sense... So, you know, when you were sitting there on television, you got a sense of who you knew what your competition was. So, therefore, when we're talking about an issue of the day, right? Now, obviously, there's people that are telling me um, that are pro-Trump, basically, look, head down, bum up, see you in two weeks, we'll see what happens when it comes to the polls. Then there's the day-in, day-out, 24-hour news cycle cable news world that is pretending that every little five minutes is different. I suppose that's what I'm trying to talk about here. What, what, what's your sense about how the election is being consumed by people? I mean, I think it's the summer, and in general, people don't pay much attention to the news in the summer, and that's not different now. I mean, it is the election cycle, so we're all getting bigger numbers than we would get in a non-summer year. But I think the average American, the ones who are going to decide this election, they're outliving their lives. You know, they're on boats, and they're watching their kids at summer camp, and they're enjoying what time they can in the beautiful sun, which is, you know, a beautiful time of year over here. So they'll start to pay attention more in September, and then things are gonna tighten, as they always do. And they tightened already once Kamala Harris became the presumptive nominee, but they're gonna get even tighter. And we really have September and October to finalize the messaging around each camp. So, you know, we're going into August, July is basically over. That gives the camps one month to try to gear up their messaging and figure out what attacks are gonna land and which ones they wanna run with in the final whatever days of this election. But early voting is going to start as as early as the, you know late September, and so you know it matters whether people are paying attention. And in those critical swing states, it matters a lot. I think the problem for the Republicans right now is that she has such a short runway, and that she's not going to be so battle tested. And battle testing Kamala Harris would be a good thing for the Republicans. We've seen her enough; those of us who are in political news and follow her closely to know she usually sounds moronic. She does. If you give her enough time to talk, she will confuse you with her word salad to the point where you're not sure you and she speak the same language, right? Is it me or is it her? Um, she's not particularly clever. She's not particularly likable. She's reversed herself on everything. She is a far left liberal from San Francisco. So if we give her enough time for exposure, the country will see that. The problem for the Republicans right now is they don't have it. They don't have said time. 
you know, w given the early voting that's been unleashed thanks to COVID, the mail-in balloting that's been happening, and the switcheroo on the top of the Democratic ticket, they've got to get all, pull out all the stops to get the messaging out her on her out there and get it ubiquitous. And the, the media won't help. Now, they are lucky that we happen to live in a time where they're not just relying on Fox News. They do have fair and balanced media outside of cable to bring people messaging. And if the news is big enough or the exchange is viral enough, it will go everywhere. You know, many of the media, like I said, the Times, they had no choice but to cover the fact that, you know, J.D. sat with me and, and said what he said about the cat comments. Um, so the Republicans are better suited right now than they've ever been to combat, you know, one party information dominance. But look, if you look at, say, 16, did Trump have it any, any worse back then with the media? No, he didn't. It was, I mean, they hated him just as much, if not more than they do now. And he won. And Republicans have won in the past, too. George W. Bush won. George H. W. Bush, Bush won. Donald Trump won, notwithstanding a media that was dominant and controlled by the left. So now they're in a better position than ever. And they've got a nominee who, at least as of a couple weeks ago, was looking at a landslide. He's still got the advantage. And so a Republicans feeling like, oh, it's hopeless, you know, because the, the, the media is going to control the message between now and November, need to buck up because they still are better suited right now to win this election than they've been in a long time. Well, and once you start delving into some of the details of these polls, like firstly, that media consumption thing I spoke about, um, in the Fox News poll, What's the most important issue, according to people, even after the change in Canada? Immigration. Uh, then daylight second. Then the... Uh, sorry, it was inflation first. Then daylight. Then immigration. Then we start getting down to single digits. So the issues are still on Trump's side. The betting market's still on Trump's side. The capacity to fight back, well and truly there. But I've got to say, you know, again, watching your show, as I always do, listening to it on Sirius XM, and I know this is sort of part of the sickliness of the, the Kamala campaign, but the cringe factor of not just the media suck up, but what they're putting out there, like, you know, great, good luck, drag queens for Kamala, um, but white dudes for Kamala, Karens for Kamala. Like, these were all people who were going to vote for Joe Biden anyway, but they're being presented as if they have returned to the fold. Those calls, white dudes for Kamala and the women, the Karens for Kamala, I mean, it is absolutely stomach-turning to listen to what the Democratic Party has become. You know, I grew up in a Democratic household. My parents were Democrats. They, my dad was a professor and my mom was a nurse. And they always felt like Republicans for, were for rich people and we weren't rich and so we were Democrats. We weren't particularly ideological, um, but we were Catholic. So we weren't, you know, liberal on every issue. In any event, that was how a lot of families were. They were sort of moderate Democrats who weren't particularly far left wing. They just sort of voted Democrat because they thought it would be better for them economically. What that party has become is unrecognizable. Did you see the woman on the on the women for, who's uh -huh. saying like, God forbid you'd correct a BIPOC, meaning person who's black or indigenous or a person of color. If yeah. you're white and a black person or a Native American heritage person, says something that's wrong, you're not allowed to correct them or you're racist. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't agree. And I will be correcting BIPOC people or white people, whether they're the future president of the United States or my neighbor. And it's disrespectful to treat them like they're so eggshell skinned that you can't point out when they say something that's stupid or wrong. <laughs> this is how the left looks at people of color. It's racist, and they don't even see it. They think they're the elevated ones trying to lecture the rest of us into being, you know, inclusive and kind, and none of that is true. So that's what the Democrats have become, and as I point out, the party that is parading, you know, naked trans people on the White House lawn. Some guy in our nuclear department who was stealing women's luggage so he could wear our dresses. Yeah. <laughs> Some guy who's parading himself out there is like, the first female to be a part of the HHS cabinet. No, he's a man who lived 55 years as a man and then declared himself a trans person and now wants to trans your kids. There's nothing normal or non-weird to, to steal their term about any of this. And what's happened now, like with the pylon and JD Vance, it's actually kind of interesting, Paul, back to that, is they almost seem like they can't or for right now don't 
want to go after Trump in the ways that they used to, because the man is 14 days after taking a bullet to his head while he's out there campaigning. And so they almost, you can sense, feel a little bit chagrined about unleashing their cannons on him in the way they have in the past. Hitler, racist, misogynist, all the things, they're kind of holding their fire a bit because he took actual fire. <laughs> we still got a scar in his ear. And so they seem to be turning it all on J.D. Vance's, like the, the stand-in for Donald Trump. I just don't think that's gonna work. I don't think people don't vote for a ticket because of the vice presidential nominee. Trump remains the 800 pound gorilla in the race. And Trump, I think, will define this race one way or the other, right? Still, whether it's Kamala across from him or Joe Biden across from him. And all they've done by subbing in candidates is even out things. You know, they were hemorrhaging because of Joe Biden with for good reason. And now we've gotten back to stasis where really Trump will wind up defining this race one way or the other. And the Democrats, their hatred for him will also define the race, right? There are more and more who are open-minded to Donald Trump because of the economy, because of immigration. And we've got, what, 90 plus days to figure out just how strong the feelings are on him.